Greetings folks and welcome to another episode of 81632-Bit. I'm Rob and today, as I'm sure some of you are already apoplectic with rage about, I'm going to discuss the Apple II and why it was basically irrelevant outside of the US market. Now I know this will upset some people, especially some of my American viewers, but the fact is, it's true. Outside of the US, the Apple II was very much a nothing system it didn't really sell huge numbers you didn't see many people with them and its impact on video games outside of the us apart from a few select titles that ended up on other platforms was largely minimal anyway before i start getting the angry comments and threats from Apple fanboys, let's have a look at the Apple II first so we can find out what the Apple II was and then we can discuss why it wasn't successful outside the US. Now, the Apple II was a microcomputer, obviously, and it was the second machine produced by Apple, although it was their first full on pre built computer. The Apple I was a hobbyist style kit computer. Now, when the Apple II launched in 1977, it used what would become the quite familiar MOS Technologies 6502 CPU. Now, the Apple ran this at 1.023 MHz, and initially the Apple II shipped with 4 kilobytes of RAM. Now, later models would expand this all the way up to 1 megabyte of RAM, but generally speaking, most Apple IIs had between 4 and 64 kilobytes of RAM, depending on which variant of the Apple II hardware you got, be it the original Apple II, the Apple II Plus, the Apple IIe, the Apple IIc, and then ultimately there was the 16-bit Apple II GS, which I'm not really going to cover in this video because it was a 16-bit machine technically and frankly in Europe it was even more irrelevant than the Apple II was. But yeah, so the Apple II had its moments. Its hardware was pretty good for the time and the fact is Apple II variants stayed in production all the way from 1977 through to 1993 which is a 17-year span which is bloody impressive. But you know, there were revisions over that time, not massive revisions unless you count the GS, that kept it mostly in pace with its competitors. Now, when the Apple II launched, as I said, it was quite a powerful piece of kit. Its main competitors in the market at that time were the Commodore PET and the Tandy TRS-80. Now, these were all relatively expensive machines, but they did quite well in the American market where in the late 70s through into the early 80s, there was a growing, incredibly affluent middle class who were getting heavily into this new computer revolution. Now, outside the US, things were progressing slightly differently. And by time Apple launched in Europe, the pricing kept it way out of most people's budgets. You were looking at a machine here with 4K RAM that was retailing in the UK for well over £1,000. And, you know, within sort of a year, 18 months of the Apple II launching, Sinclair launched its own ZX80, then the ZX81, which were retailing for approximately £100, so 10% of the cost of an Apple II. And whilst they weren't technically as powerful, only having monochrome displays and 1K of RAM, they were easier and cheaper for people to buy. And it was an expense that could be much more readily justified. And as we moved into the 1980s with Apple upgrading the Apple II to the Apple II Plus model, again, there were just things that held it back. Price was one. The fact that to get colour graphics you needed to purchase an adding card because the changes made to the hardware to meet the PAL specifications meant that the base Apple II Plus hardware could only output a monochrome display. And of course, as we head into the 80s, Commodore launched its incredibly successful C64, which was a huge hit worldwide and again was substantially cheaper than the Apple II. And, you know, certainly in Europe, you also had the Sinclair Spectrum, which came in 1982, 
which again was approximately 10% the price of an Apple II, but offered 48, 16 or 48K of RAM as standard, color graphics, albeit with some caveats, and was just plug in and play into a domestic TV set, so no expensive monitors needed. It utilized, as did the Commodore 64 in Europe, the standard audio cassette method of delivery, which could be done on the Apple II, but the majority of Apple II software was delivered on what were, for the time, quite expensive five and three quarter inch floppy disks. Now, as the 80s progressed, Apple did keep doing minor updates to the Apple II range. Like I said, there was the E and the C ranges, which had, again, minor tweaks. By the time the C and E came out, you didn't need the adding card for the color graphics anymore, but the price remained high and availability wasn't great. And of course, you know, Amstrad launched their popular CPC range, which did really well in the UK and Germany in particular, France and Germany and France, sorry, in particular, and the Sinclair machines continued selling. They updated the Sinclair Spectrum to 128K of RAM and added an onboard audio chip. The Commodore 64 was redesigned into a cheaper version, the C64C, I think it was referred to as, which was cost-reduced, allowed them to reduce the retail price and gain more of a foothold in the market. Now, in America, part of the Apple II's success, apart from its larger, more affluent middle class at the time, was its inroads into the educational market. Apple often shifted huge numbers of Apple IIs to schools, colleges, etc. at discounted rates. Now, every other country in the world tried something similar to this. France had the Minitel systems and the UK famously had the BBC sponsored BBC Micros, especially the Model B, which from a hardware perspective was kind of similar to the Apple II with a 6502 processor and more limited RAM than its competitors. But again, it was much cheaper, even though the BBC Micro Model B was considered to be expensive by British standards, often retailing for close to £400, this was still approximately a third to half the price of an Apple II. Now, don't get me wrong, the Apple II was for its time a great piece of hardware and Apple did some brilliant stuff in supporting it through the 80s with adding cards, hardware revisions and tweaks. But ultimately, outside of the American market where it gained a huge foothold thanks to its educational um, market share, it really wasn't an irrelevant set. You never saw people talking about the Apple II and raving about it. As I said, apart from a handful of games, most notably Prince of Persia, which was converted to pretty much every micro under the sun, it just didn't register as a system that people were interested in. And I do think the main reason for this was cost. Over a thousand pounds was a lot, and by the time you got to sort of 85, 86, 87, you had the Amiga and the Atari ST hitting the market, which, whilst they were a similar price, they were significantly more powerful. And as I've already mentioned, Apple's sort of repost to this was the Apple II GS, but that was even more of a distant machine in Europe. And they just, for whatever reason, Apple have always been a premium priced company and in the 1980s outside of a few select markets like the US that didn't really work you know in Europe it was all about low cost micros and that's what sold over here it didn't seem to matter what Apple did and how much Apple pushed the productivity side of its systems and its expandability, it just never took hold in Europe. And as I said, it was a cost issue realistically. I certainly didn't know anybody that could have afforded an Apple II, but I knew plenty of people that ended up with Amigas and STs, and Commodore 64, Spectrums, Amstrads, even BBCs. It's just how it worked out. Now, if anybody wants to refute this, if anybody can come back at me and say, well, actually, you're wrong. This is what happened. This is how the Apple II was successful elsewhere. Be my guest. 
I'm more than willing to keep an open mind on this and see what people have to say. But I really don't think I'm stepping outside the bounds when I say the Apple II was basically a failure and irrelevant outside of its home American market. Now, if you enjoyed this video today, do hit the like and subscribe buttons. Uh, ring that bell if you really enjoyed it. You can also contribute and help me out by contributing to my Ko-fi page and my Patreon if you wish. Um, no obligation. I do these videos for fun. Anything that anybody wants to donate is entirely seen as just a nice little thank you, like a tip. Um, obviously, if you haven't liked this video, tell me. That's what the comments down below are for. But please keep it polite. I'm all about polite debate. I don't want to get into slanging matches and all that fanboy nonsense. I'm here to enjoy retro computer games, retro video games, the systems and the discussion around them. Anyway, I'm Rob. This has been 81632-bit and I will see you on the next video.